So recall that the air we breathe in, for example, the air I'm breathing in right now in this room, is composed of many different types of gas molecules. For example, oxygen molecules, carbon dioxide molecules, water vapor molecules, helium molecules, nitrogen molecules, H2 molecules, and so on. And all these molecules are traveling with very high speeds and they collide with one another with the walls of this room as well as all the different types of objects found in this room. So what happens when I take any object, say this battery, and I raise it and I let go? Well the object will begin traveling downward because it's being pulled by our mass of the earth. So a gravitational field is created and that force is exerted on our object and therefore our object travels downward. Now, as our object travels downward, it makes collisions with the air molecule. So if we look at this illustration, for example, this object is traveling downward and it will make collisions with these molecules found in the air, so the gas molecules found in the air. And that means these collisions will create forces on the object. And these forces will be in the opposite direction of velocity. So if our object is moving downward, the forces created on this object by the air molecules will be in the opposite direction. And that means these forces will slow down our object. Now collectively, all the forces exerted by all the gas molecules is known as air resistance. So it's exactly what the word implies. It's the resistance due to the air molecules found in the space around the object, around the moving object. Now, <coughs> objects traveling in air experience resistance forces due to the air molecules. That's exactly what we just said. Now, so far, we spoke about projectile motion and we neglected air resistance. But air resistance does exist in everyday life. So it's important to study what air resistance is and how it affects the motion of objects. So let's examine three factors that affect our air resistance. So let's look at the first one, velocity or simply speed, the magnitude of our velocity. So we're going to make the assumption that we're dealing with small objects with relatively small speeds. And that means we can use the following formula to approximate the force created by the air molecules. Now this force is known as the drag force and it is the resistive force felt by the object due to the gas molecules found in the air. And we can approximate the force by this formula where the negative sign simply means the force is acting in the opposite direction of our velocity. So in this example when our object was moving downward the force that the molecules exerted on this object was in the opposite direction. Now this velocity represents the magnitude of the object that's traveling through our air and this this B is simply a constant. It's known as the proportionality constant. And it depends on the viscosity of our fluid, of our gas. Now, what this formula states is the following. The higher our velocity, the more drag force our object feels. So, if this battery is traveling with a higher speed, with a higher magnitude of velocity, that means the air molecules exert a larger force, a large drag force on the object. So, let's look at the following equation. Let's look at our object traveling or free falling. And let's look at the different forces that this object experiences. So, one force, the reason our object falls in the first place is because our gravity pulls down an object. And the force is given by m times g, so mass times the gravitational field g. Now, the other force that this object feels is the force due to these air molecules, so the drag force, and it acts in the opposite direction to velocity. And that's why we have the negative sign here. So our drag force is pointing upward. So at any given time, our object in free fall can or will can accelerate. And its equation is given by the following formula, where the net force on the object is equal to our force of gravity minus our drag force. 
and this is equal to, simply we take this formula and replace it, we plug it into here, and we get mg minus b times v, and this is equal to m times a. So at any given time, our object is accelerating, and we can find the acceleration using this formula. So at the beginning, when I first let go of my object, my object, or the force of gravity, is much higher than the force of these molecules, or the drag force. So in the beginning, this force is much higher than this force, and that's exactly why the acceleration initially is so high. Eventually, however, when our object reaches a large enough velocity, the drag force will be the same as the force of gravity. And at this point, our MA becomes zero. At this point, our object is no longer accelerating. And this velocity is known as terminal velocity. In other words, when our mg equals our bv, when these two guys are equal, our object stops accelerating. And this velocity is known as the terminal velocity. So every object will reach this terminal velocity. And when it does reach this velocity, at this velocity, the force of gravity equals the drag force. And so our object will continue to move, but it will move with a constant speed, with a constant velocity, because it's no longer accelerating. And the formula to find the terminal velocity is as follows. Because this guy is now zero, we simply take this guy, bring it to this side. So on one side, we have mg equals bv. And so we bring the b to this side, and we get m times g divided by b gives us the velocity or terminal velocity of our object. Now aside from velocity, there are two other factors that affect our air resistance or drag force. Surface area and shape. Let's begin by looking at surface area. So the larger our surface area of the object traveling through space, the more collisions our object will make with the air molecules. And that means if we have on average more collisions occurring, we have a larger drag force. So a small surface area means that our molecules will not be colliding very often with our object, or will be colliding less often, and therefore the drag force will be less. So let's look at the shape of the object. How does the shape affect our air resistance? So objects with a smooth streamlined shape experience less drag force than objects with irregular shapes and rough surfaces. And you've experienced this if you ever stuck your hand out the window in a moving car. If you stick your hand out the window and align it this way, you will not feel very much drag force. And you'll be able to move your hand up and down with little problem. But if you switch your hand this way, if you change your position and shape to this shape, you will feel much more drag force. And in fact, your hand might go flying backwards. And that's because you're changing the shape of your object. Now that's actually exactly why parachutes are able to sustain people in air. The reason that a person survives when jumping out of an airplane is because of the shape of the parachute. The shape allows a large drag force and so a large drag force means a very small velocity. So now finally let's look at the mass. Now mass, unlike velocity, surface area, and shape, does not actually affect the drag force or air resistance. But what it does affect is the pathway that our object takes. For example, if you ever went bowling, you know that the pins aren't able to stop our bowling ball. And that's because our bowling ball has a very high mass. So think of the bowling ball as an object traveling through space. And think of the pins as the air molecules. The larger your mass, the less likely the air molecules will stop the moving mass. So for example, if you try to bowl instead with a soccer ball, the soccer ball will be deflected. It won't be able to stop or it won't be able to knock down the pins. And that's because the mass of the bowling ball is much higher than the mass of the soccer ball. The soccer ball does not have very much mass. Now, one other important note. Notice that when our object is traveling through space, its net force remains the same regardless of the, obje of the object's mass. So if we have two objects with the same shape and size, but different masses, they will experience the same net force. So m times a will be the same. <coughs> and that means if one of the objects has a larger mass, 
they will have a smaller acceleration because mass and A are inversely proportional. So the higher the mass, the less acceleration we will have. And the lower the mass, the more acceleration we will have. 